Good afternoon all. Uh, welcome back to Sambad. Today we have the fourth talk of our ongoing talk series on robotics. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Sanat K. Bishwas from uh, IIIT Delhi. And uh, he'll be speaking about navigation and tracking in space. Uh, Professor Sachin Rao is the session chair for today's talk. And uh, he's, as you know, uh, an associate professor here at IIIT Bank. So over to you, Sachin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so let me first thank uh, Dr. Sanat for agreeing to present his work in our uh, Samvad series. Uh, so I think this is the first time that we may be actually getting a discussion about uh, some topics in the domain of space. The last three lectures were on uh, robotic systems. And uh, so just to briefly introduce our speaker. So he got his PhD from uh, the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He's on several committees related to the space programs. And uh, without wasting too much time, let me uh, request him to present his work and uh, his idea. So over to you, uh, Sanat. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, that it's uh, today it will be a little bit off topic from what you generally discuss. However, I hope at the end of the talk, um, uh, it will be clear that the navigation and tracking in space is more or less similar to what we do in the in the robotics field as well. So I will try to pose these problems as a state estimation problem and a observer design problem, if you may. So, so then we can see the connection between what happens in robotics as well as in what happens in space and more or less similar. And we can also we'll be able to see space vehicles are nothing less than a robots. So that would be the connection. So with that, I. Uh, first thing first, so I'll first introduce a little bit, talk about a little bit about our institute, IIIT Delhi. It's a young university, state university started in 2008. So it's a research driven academic institute and we have uh, BTEC, MTech, and PhD programs. And we have uh, six departments uh, in start, ranging from electronics and communication, and which happens to be my department. And we also have, uh, definitely we have as a IIIT, we have a computer science and, and engineering engineering department, computational biology, human center design, mathematics, and social science and humanities. So these are the departments. Apart from that, we have various center research centers as well as individual research laboratories. So I uh, belong to the space systems laboratory where we work on uh, various areas. So many three different uh, areas, uh, GNSS te uh, technology, state estimation and their application in space. So in GNSS technology, we work on deflectometry, precise, precise point positioning, GNSS vulnerability, and state estimation, we try to develop new, modify the uh, existing estimation algorithms for space applications, or in general, nonlinear state estimation problems. So, sorry, what is, uh, what is GNSS? It's GNSS is Global Navigation Satellite Systems. So, and in the space applications, all the uh, uh, topics that I have mentioned, we apply it in space domain, maybe space vehicle guidance, navigation and control, space situational awareness and navigation beyond uh, space service volume. So space service volume is basically the, uh, uh, the volume where the GNSS uh, satellites can work on. Uh, and uh, work on, and beyond that, how do we navigate that we also explore sometimes. And application domains are defense, space, uh, agricultural technology, weather forecast, and climate monitoring in a broad sense. So this is our website, ssl.tripleitd.in. And some of the projects, funded research project, projects that we are working on are precise orbit determination of low Earth orbit satellites, funded by East Orange Point Program, and uh, measurement of geoparameters for high altitude navigation satellite signals using SDR. So this is funded by uh, Department of Science and Technology, and we are also uh, uh, working uh, uh, on a project funded by National Supercomputing Mission on orbit computation of resilient space objects for space situational awareness. So that is basically mainly try to predict the collision probability with the space debris and active satellites. So that's what we, we do. Um, 
And these are our supporters and collaborators, DST, ISRO, National Supercomputer Mission, uh, Australian Center for Space Engineering Research, and Macquarie University. So now, does, uh, does ISRO share data with you on the debris uh, collision estimation? So uh, for uh, space debris related data, we get it from Space Surveillance Network. So that is by uh, US Department of Defense, really. But ISRO does not have that framework for sharing, sharing the data yet. But they are, I think the, they are de developing that as well. Okay. Uh, so now uh, we'll talk, now let's uh, go to the main topic of the discussion that is navigation and traffic, tracking. And first I'll focus on what is the difference. So in control, there's a tracking problem as well, but here from, from this navigation perspective or determining position and velocity perspective, this tracking is a little bit different. So navigation is when a vehicle determines its own position, velocity, and time. And tracking is when a position, velocity, and time of a vehicle is determined external. So navigation is when the vehicle itself determines all these parameter uh, uh, variables and uh, or estimate the variables and tracking is from outside the vehicle when we try to find where the particular vehicle or space vehicle is. So both are closely related and often distinguished by where the me measurements are done and where the decisions being made. So obviously measurements are, when the decisions made uh, and measurements are made on the space vehicle itself, then it becomes navigation. And when we do it from ground, then it becomes tracking. So observe, what are these observations or measurements? So mainly angle, range, Doppler shift, output of inertial measurement uh, units. These are observations and this are very, uh, nowadays sometimes vision-based observations are also used, but we'll mainly focus on all the, these angle and range uh, later on. And the underlying mathematical frame, framework for position, uh, position velocity determination are same for navigation and tracking. So that we will also see. So now, a generalized fr framework for navigation and tracking. So what we have is that we need a space vehicle. We have some sort of observations and there will be some estimation happening in the process. And now depending on these observation where it's, it's happening and estimation where it's happening, it could be navigation or it could be tracking. So uh, what, could, what are the various types of space vehicles? So it could be launch vehicle, it's a satellite, or in low Earth, medium Earth, or geostationary orbit, or it could be interplanetary spacecraft as well, going to moon, going to Mars, or beyond as well, and as well as re-entry vehicle which come back comes back to the uh, to Earth. So those are we uh, consider as space vehicles, and observations are time of arrival. So when a signal comes, so generally we look at um, when we do the, this navigation tracking, we're tracking, we do the uh, uh, do use radio uh, uh, signals, uh, radio signals, and we find out time of arrival, time difference of arrival. So then we are comparing between two signal sources from there where the difference between when these two signals are coming. Then angle of arrival from where the signal is coming, the angle with respect to some sort of reference. And these are the method. And what are the systems that are used for getting these observations? They are GNSS, as I mentioned earlier, Global Navigation Satellite System, SLR, Satellite Laser Ranging, Deep Space Network, or DSN. So Deep Space Network is basically a network of three facilities uh, around the world. One is in California, one is in Madrid, and one uh, another one is in Canberra, Australia. So they are a complex of uh, very uh, uh, large radars. So using this deep space network, uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Laboratory NASA, they track uh, the deep space uh, spacecraft. For example, whenever they do the mission in Jupiter or beyond, Voyager, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they are being tracked by DSN. So this DSN based uh, position velocity estimation is a, a ideal example of tracking. And when we do it in a lower orbit using GNSS, then it becomes navigation. So, so basically the satellite itself has a GPS receiver or GNSS receiver, which gets all the observation and process it and find out what is the position where it exactly is. So then it becomes navigation. And what are the methods we use to find out? So eventually see that we are actually uh, 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 measuring some scalar 
and there's range, time difference of arrival. Time difference arrival, you can think of it's a difference of difference in range. But when we uh, we do, do not want this, we actually want position velocity as vectors, right? So how do we get that? So that for that, we use various types of estimation algorithms, least square estimation or Kalman filter or particle filter. So these we'll be discussing today. So first we'll talk about the Kalman filter. So we are not going to the details of this square. So that is a uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, it's a, a very uh, common and we directly go to the Kalman filter. Even Kalman filter is also, now it is a very common uh, estimation algorithms, but here we'll talk about some problems that are being faced in, uh, in space vehicle navigation when we use Kalman filter and what are the uh, methods that we can use to tackle this problem. So that we'll also discuss. So Kalman filter is a class of navigation algorithm. It's not a single algorithm, it's a class of navigation algorithms used mostly for estimation of quantity on the fly. So mostly in real time. Also it is used for in the post-processing. So you gather all the measurements and you uh, then you process it, uh, process it on ground. So that can be done. However, Kalman filter, the first one that was in, uh, implemented, so that was for real time application. So, interestingly, this Kalman filter, or rather extended Kalman filter, which, which we'll talk about later on, was developed for Apollo mission. So, it started, the, so, so the Kalman filter was uh, first implemented in Apollo land, lunar landing mission for landing the uh, lunar module, the Kalman filter was used for the first time, extended Kalman filter. Uh, and it is a filter in the sense that uh, it reduces the effect of the noise in the measurements on, uh, on the quantity uh, to be estimated, but it is not a filter like analog or digital filters in, in, the, in that sense. So, and the figure in the right so that you can uh, is basically tells you uh, tells you the what Kalman filter does in a nutshell. So you have two set of information. One is your observation that you can see here. So this H. Uh, okay. So first thing is that Y is uh, some vector that we want to estimate, and for our case, it's basically position and velocity stacked together and becomes a six cross one vector. So that we want to estimate. And our measurement is a function of this uh, y, and k is basically the time, uh, discrete time interval, one, two, three, four, right? And h could be a nonlinear function. And mu is some noise. So as I was telling, so all the measurements will have some noise, will have some errors. So that is one part set of information. Another center set of information comes from the theory or the mathematical model of how Y changes, right? So for example, for space vehicles or for simple satellite, right? How the position changes over time, it is governed by Newton's law of gravitation uh, in the ideal scenario. But there is a lot of deviations also there. And if in reality, there is always mismatch between what Newton's law tells us and what we get, right? So that means the mathematical model that Newton's law of gravitation gives us, it's not perfect. It has some sort of uncertainties incorporated. In it. Well, we don't say uncertainty, but it's some deviation from the real, really how the position or velocity changes over time, right? But control theories have come up uh, 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 with a sophisticated way of deter uh, of uh, representing the, these deviation as some sort of uncertainty. So we can think of that. Okay, we have a mathematical model, but that is not perfect, and that is basically is why we uh, uh, incorporate some uncertainty in the model, and that then that, that becomes a stochastic differential equations, right? So now this there are two set of uh, information. One is the actual measurement that we do, and another is this model in form mathematical model or mathematical representation. What we believe is the closest to the truth, right? So this set of informations we put in the Kalman filter, and eventually it gives us an estimate. That estimate is denoted by y hat which comes with a lesser answer, right? So this is overall Kalman filter does. So now let us a little bit discuss about the Kalman filter framework in the 
for the non linear discrete estimation problem. So linear discrete estimation problem is pretty simple. What happens is that your state is linearly depend, uh, dependent on the previous uh, 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 value of the state what was there at the previous time. So uh, so the, here you can see there's a phi which is called the state transition matrix. So y uh, y k plus one equal to phi k uh, y k plus some noise, right? So and then you have a measurement equation that is also linear. So z k plus one equal to h h is a matrix. Phi is also a matrix multiplied by this y k plus one plus mu k, right? Nu k plus one, right? So this is basically your linear discrete estimation problem. And there, our goal is to estimate y given this z or sequence of z, right? So now, what some terminologies? So error is basically true value minus estimate. Uh, P k is called the error covariance matrix. So, which is the expected value of delta y, uh, uh, y delta y transpose. QK is the process noise covariance matrix. It basically comes from the process noise, this omega k. And RK is the measurement noise covariance matrix, which is coming from the measurement noise nu k, right? And uh, for all cases, we are considering this noises are Gaussian, right? So then Kalman filter has two steps. One is prediction, another one is update. So in the prediction step, you use this uh, dynamics that you already know, right? So except the noise, because that we do not really know how much it is. So that we can somehow quantify the effect in the uh, in the error covariance propagation. So if, if you look at this, the state propagation is linear, error covariance propagation is linear, and whatever more, uh, measurement that we are predicting, so that is also linearly we are predicting, right, in the prediction step. So in the prediction step, we, we do three things. One is we predict what is going to be the next step, what is going to be the error covariance in the next step, and what is going to be the measurement. And in the update state, we have the, we basically update whenever a new measurement, actual measurement comes in. So, so this, uh, many times I've seen that students get confused that Z hat is basically what we compute a priori and Z is the actual vision. So now how do we update? Up, our updated estimate is Y hat plus is equal to I, Y hat minus, which we predicted earlier step, multiplied by some, this some, some, some gain K multiplied by the residue. Residue is the actual measurement minus what you compute in the prediction step. So that is your residue. Now this gain K is called the Kalman gain. And this comes, uh, this looks like this equation. And now you might ask, okay, so how does this equation come? So you can actually prove that if you set this K as the, in this form, then what happens is that this, your estimate what you calculate as the error covariance that is minimized for linear system, right? So, and this is your uh, uh, um, covariance update equation. And if you set this k as this using this equation, then p will be the p will be minimized. And that is the whole goal of the Kalman filter. It minimizes the error covariance, right? So now, so far we have what we have is very nicely nice looking. Uh, Linear equations, stochastic equation, though, but it's linear. However, that does is not the case for space vehicles, right? So, as I was earlier mentioning for satellite example, the dynamics, it's even in the, in the simplest form, right? So, it is uh, basically nonlinear equation. If you think of Newton's law of gravitation, right? We we'll later on will see, but it's nonlinear. Uh, if you think of launch vehicle and uh, re-entry vehicles as well. The equations that we'll see as well, so that are actually highly nonlinear. So in that case, how do we accommodate this kind of nonlinearity in this Kalman filter framework? So for that, extended Kalman filter was used. So actually, uh, 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 initially for uh, Apollo mission landing, they tried using Kalman filter, but it did not work. So then NASA MS Space, uh, Space Center came up with this extended Kalman filter, which worked nicely. 
uh, for them. It landed that we know. And so, what is the problem here now? Is that our measurement is nonlinear as well. Our system is also nonlinear. Right. So, what extended carbon filter does? What is the difference? It does differently. It uses this nonlinear dynamic uh, differential equation. Numerically propagates it into the next step. Right. Earlier, we are using this linear, linear method. If you do this linear, linear propagation of step, it will not work in the nonlinear system. So what it does is that it uses this nonlinear differential equation, numeric, uh, numerically integrates it, propagates to the next time step where you get a new measure. Right? That's only the difference. Rest of the part are same. Your covariance propagation is linear. However, that introduces some error as well. Uh, and uh, that introduces some error as well in highly nonlinear problems. So that is a drawback of extended Kalman filter when you have a highly nonlinear problems. Then also the Kalman, extended Kalman filter does not estimate uh, your state properly. So that is the problem. And we'll see later on some results about that as well. First, let me go through the more accurate approach. So what when this nonlinearity is high, what to do? We can use unscented carbon filter. So what unscented carbon filter does, it is still the same carbon filter framework, but in the unscented carbon filter, so as I do uh, mentioned in the extended carbon filter, the covariance propagation is linear, although the system is nonlinear, right? So that's kind of approximation. Unsected convolution also does this approximation, but this co covariance propagation is not linear. So what it does for that is, it creates some sample points. Sample points in the sense that whenever, if you think of a Kalman filter, right, it gives you a state estimate as well as the error covariance, right? So that means if you think from scalar perspective, it gives you standard deviation and a band, uh, and the mean, right? So mean state vector and error covariance it gives, that means you have uh, the statistics about how the distribution could be, right? So now, unscented Kalman filter, what it does is that from the given statistics, it does some deterministic sampling. It does some deterministic sampling. So create number of state vectors, multiple number of state vectors at the previous time step, and you take each of them then you propagate each of them in the next time step using this. So although here I am showing you the uh, this uh, definite uh, analytical form of integral, however, it is done. When you do computationally, it's done numerically, right? So generally RK4 or some other more uh, sophisticated inte integration uh, method, numerical integration method can be used. So then what you do is you can uh, propagate each of them in the next time step. Now, if, if you have the samples in the next time step, you can actually calculate the mean and you can calculate the error covariance, right? So this is overall the Kalman, it's unscented Kalman filter does. It does not calculate the error covariance using linear covariance propagation. So by doing so, you it can be proved the uh, creators of unscented Kalman filter, Julian and, Julia and Ullman, so they proved that the accuracy of this method is still the hard, uh, 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 at least second order Taylor's is dots, right? However, there is a catch in this unscented Kalman filter. That is the number of samples, how many samples you, you want to draw out of this um, statistics, posterior statistics, so that depends on the number of state variables that you have. So say you have n number, n dimensional state vector that you need to estimate. So in that case, you need to first augment the state vector by uh, in such a way that the dimension becomes 2n. I'm not going to the details how to, uh, what are those augmented variables are, but then dimension becomes 2n. So now you have to create this two multiplied by two n plus one number of uh, grid points or the sample points. So that means if you, if you uh, your number of uh, variables increases, your number of integration that you need to perform becomes larger, right? And that creates a computational bottleneck. And 
then many times it's possible that you cannot perform this real time estimation of positional velocity uh, velocity so then so the, the, uh, so although so then what uh, what is happening we could try to solve the drawbacks that we had in, in, uh, in the extended kalman filter for highly nonlinear applications however then we we are facing some new problems right it's slow what to do so the solution one of the solution would be i do not know uh, there, uh, uh, there could be more other solutions as well so one solution that came up with is called the single propagation uncentered kalman filter or spukf and by the name you can understand that it's one propagation only not multiple propagations so what we did uh, did was that we take the a posterior mean we propagate only that a priori uh, a posterior mean to the next time step and based on the previous error coherence although we create the sample points at the previous time step we do not propagate them we know that what are the differences and based on the differences we can actually reconstruct all the uh, uh, all the samples in the next time step using first order taylor series approximation so then we found that it improves quite a lot the computation time however since we are doing this first order approximation it's not as good as uncentered kalman filter the accuracy the is better than uh, 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 extended kalman filter but it's not as good as the uncentered kalman filter. So, so which point would you select here say something at the center of the uh... Uncertainty ellipse or something. So that is the uh, uh, the mean. Okay, correct. The mean of the. Yeah, so mean will be propagated, and based on the deviations that we have in the mean in the previous time, we will reconstruct them in the next. But how many? How many will be reconstructed in the next sample? Like here, you've shown all four. of them. All of them. But that would be infinite in number, no? Ideally. No, no. So as I mentioned, that if you have any number of uh, uh, variables, then uh, augmented state vector will be two in, and your number of samples that you will be drawing for un uncentered Kalman filter is not infinite. It's finite and deterministic. It's two multiplied by two in plus one. So that many number of samples is there. So basically, two multiplied by two in number will be in cross checking, and for plus one, that is the mean. Uh, so, uh, so the same number of samples we are actually reconstructing rather than propagating. But as I mentioned, there's still some errors because uncentered Kalman filter guarantees some sort of, uh, till second order or sometimes third order Taylor systems. So that is not there here. So that is why the there still some errors are there. So, so then we came up with another technique that is extrapolated single propagation uncentered Kalman filter. So you could think that, okay, so rather than doing first order Taylor series approximation, you could do just second order Taylor, Taylor series approximation, right? However, there is a problem. That is, then we have to calculate the Hessian. Hessian of nonlinear system calculation is very difficult, right? So that is why we did not follow the, that path. We used Richardson extrapolation, multidimensional Richardson extrapolation, where we could we can show that we can actually automatically increase the second order terms when we do this Richardson extrapolation. So there what we do is that instead of using the different deviation that we can calculate from the mean, we take half of the deviation and we propagate them in the half steps. And then we take the linear combination of this co complete full step uh, uh, the way we do here in the single propagation technique and the half step that we use we take the linear combination of both of them and then reconstruct it although it creates a little bit more fewer uh, uh, some more steps in the computation it's more but still it's a uh, it's a good trade off so how it's a good trade off that i will show when we see the result so now we'll implement these uncentered Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter, and these new uh, uh, uncentered Kalman filters in various estimation problems. 
tracking problems or navigation problems. So first is launch vehicle navigation or launch vehicle tracking. So there, this is the state where uh, uh, the dynamics of the launch vehicle, right? So what are the state uh, variables that we want to estimate here is the down range distance. So say that this is your launch, launching point. From there, this distance is called the down range distance. The altitude from the sea level, what is the altitude? We also need to know the velocity of the launch vehicle. And then the flight path angle. So with the local horizon, what is the, the angle of the launch vehicle's primary axis? So that is our flight path angle. And mass, we need to estimate because for launch vehicle, right? So it's there's a uh, uh, gas is uh, 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 going out of it, right? So 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 that that is why mass is also deflated, and we need to say mass is has to be estimated as well because of the relation that we have with the velocity, right? Uh, change of velocity, right? So we need to know the mass as well. So that's why we are estimating that and c is the aerodynamic coefficient of the launch vehicle right so and if you look at this for this the c is constant so that is why c dot is equal to zero so others let us not discuss about how this came is coming from simple uh, mechanics uh, mechanics uh, you can construct it by looking at this free body diagram and then do it so i'm not going to uh, go into the details so this and if you look at the structure obviously it's pretty clear that's very normal Right, but again, how nonlinear? Uh, how much uh, nonlinearity you can call very nonlinear? How much we call nonlinearity? We call uh, moderately nonlinear. That is a question as well. So that a little bit we will discuss later on. So what would be the uh, control inputs for a vehicle such as this, like canards or something like that at the back? Like if you want to change say, the flight path angle or something. So for that, uh, you it's basically thrust thrust vector, right? So basically direction of the uh, nozzle. Vector. So yeah. that you change. Okay. And the, if it's the, liquid, liquid propulsion, then you can change the thrust as well, but solid propulsion you cannot. Okay, there you would need fins or something, I think, to change yes. the depth. Okay, cool. Yes. Okay, so now how do we test it? So we cannot fly a launch vehicle with an untested estimation algorithm, right? So uh yesterday's example is um uh another uh, motivation for us not to do it without doing tons of simulation well uh so yesterday uh isro launched this sslb they did a lot of simulation but still it failed right so the issue was uh the velocity tumor so again it's a controller so that failed it did not work properly, so that that's why their SSLB was uh, failed yesterday. So, so that that is the catch. That even after doing immense number of simulations, still things get failed, right? What so, what is the uh, SSLB? I mean, I heard of GSLB, PSLB. What is SSLB? SSLB is a new one. It's called Small Satellite Launch Vehicle. Okay. Uh, so that is again. That is again. I think uh, it uh, uh, the Capacity of this launch vehicle, the vehicle is small. So I think till 500 kg satellite it, it launches. Okay. So that is the first uh, launch vehicle from the SSLB class they launched this start. Right? But uh, again, I mean, they worked diligently, but still it failed, right? So that is why we have to be very, uh, very careful when we do all the simulations, and that is the motivation that we should do simulation first, right? And then that's what we did. We did a hardware in loop simulation using for launch vehicles. So the launch vehicle that we used, model we used was uh, the Falcon 9 B1.1 launch vehicle from SpaceX, right? So that we created a reference trajectory and that we fed to a signal simulator, DNS signal, GPS signal simulator. So what it does is that the simu signal simulator tricks an actual receiver that the receiver thinks that it is on a launch vehicle and it provides the signal accordingly, according to whatever this trajectory is uh, we put in the simulator. And this signal is completely radio frequency, same uh, signal quality that you get, get, so that is provided directly fed to the receiver, right? So now we are fooling this receiver to think that it is on a launch vehicle and it's moving. 
So what, they know what about can... uh, what about the environmental conditions and so on? Can you can you use that in the hardware in the loop as well? Uh, yes. So environmental conditions are simulated uh, in, in in this spy and simulator. So this box that you can see. So everything is done here, and accordingly, according to the, it calculates what, what could be the attenuation. Uh, what is the atmospheric delay? What is the tropospheric delay? All these things are simulated inside the simulator. And okay. accordingly, it provides us the RF signal. Uh, so now we then this receiver provides us these measurements. And then, then we use various estimation algorithms. And then we compare and find out how far we are from the reference trajectory that we fed to the simulator, spirate simulator, right? So this is the framework for the simulation. Now these are the results. So there we compared EKF, SPUKF, SPUKF, and uncentered Kalman filter as well. And there, if you look at it, that EKF result is this one, right? So here you can see altitude estimation is quite bad, around 200 meter. And down range distance also is not very good, but the the SPUKF, ESPUKF, the unsimplified Kalman filter family, the errors are pretty small, right? And if you look at the processing time, so main uh, uh, objective of this SPUKF and ESPUKF were actually to reduce the processing time of the unsimplified Kalman filter. So this figure tells you this processing time again that we have. So x-axis is the processing time and y-axis is the average position error. Extended Kalman filter is here. So S4, 6, 8, 10 are number of satellites that are being used for tracking the launch vehicle. So for various number of satellites, we have done that. So for the extended Kalman filter, if you see that obviously when you increase the number of satellites, then actually your error decreases. However, still it's higher, but the processing time is very small. Unscented Kalman filter, always within 10 meter average error. However, the processing time is around 50 milliseconds. But SPUKF and SPUKF pushes it to the left hand side, although it does not increase the error as much as the extended Kalman filter. So obviously we can say that ESPUKF is the better one to use for this type of problems, right? SPUKF is also fine. So this is this becomes a trade-off, which one you want to choose. So now another example is the entry vehicle. Dynamics is more or less sense on the same, but what is the, the difference is that we do not have any thrust. So re-entry vehicle is basically from a certain orbit. The spacecraft is coming down to the atmosphere, right? And again, you can see that equations uh, of motion is high, uh, pretty nonlinear. And what are the observations? The observations are actually rudder range observations. And rudder range observations, so from this point, we were, we are calculating the range and we are, interested, we are interested in the altitude and the down range distance, right? So this is what we want to estimate as well as the velocity. This is, we, we have done entirely using simulation because we do not have the provision of hardware into simulation using the radar. So there we have reference trajectory. We simulated the radar observations, added the noises and errors, whatever we have, and we fed it to the estimation algorithm and then we are compared, right? So there we can also see that extended carbon filter, average position error is very high, 3500, 3.5 kilometer we have, right? However, if you look at the SPUKF and SPUKF, they are actually far better than an extended Kalman filter. Whereas it, although it does not, the error is, accuracy is not as good as the uncentered Kalman filter, but it's better, right? But processing time is very small, right? So this is, uh, the, the figure that shows that efficiency of the uncentered Kalman, ESPUKF and SPUKF in this reentry vehicle tracking problem as well. So now we'll see that application in tracking a satellite or navigation 
of a satellite right so there let's talk a little bit about satellite dynamics right so it's very uh, we can build from the very basic that is newton's law of gravitation so the force between two objects right with with mass m and capital m and m could be this right minus g m m by r square g is the universal gravitational constant and the acceleration will be minus g m by r, r square for the smaller object so like the larger object for us is r and smaller object is m and this equation is valid only when we consider that the earth is a perfect sphere and it's a uniform uh, density it has a uniform density then only you can think earth as a point mass satellite itself we can think of a point mass it's not a not an issue but earth considering is a point mass is incurs a lot of error that we will see later on however i mean let us consider that assumptions are true and then we considering the r as a point mass the vector equation would be r double dot equal to minus mu r cube multiplied by r right so that is the acceleration vector right mu is equal to uh, g multiplied by the mass of the r now in reality the acceleration is actually min minus mu r cube r plus ap AP is called the acceleration due to perturbation forces. What are these perturbation forces? So that is the, these perturbation for, uh, forces comes from the non-uniform gravitational field of the Earth. Why the non-uniform uh, non uh, gravitational field? Because Earth is not a perfect sphere; it's ir fairly irregular in shape, and the density is also not uniform, right? Uh, in various places, it has a very different density. And if we consider that, then it becomes significantly uh, different than considering the point mass. Then we also have the gravitational forces from other bodies, from sun, from the moon. Uh, so for Earth-bound satellites, we can only consider sun and the moon. However, for interplanetary spacecraft, we have to uh, consider the gravitational forces from other planets as well. Then we have atmospheric drag. You could say, okay, so the satellites are fairly outside the atmosphere. It's not actually most of the low Earth orbit satellites are uh, within the atmosphere range. So that creates a little bit of drag as well. So if we want to be very precise, we have to include atmospheric drag as well as solar radiation pressure. So solar radiation pressure is basically the you have the solar cells and then photons are. Uh, 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 photons are basically bombarding on the solar cell, human, right? And then what happens is then, then there's an absorption of the photon happens, reflection of the photons happening. So that creates a, a momentum transfer. So that is why some forces for these photons also add some uh, force, right? So that is the, we call the solar radiation pressure. So all these things are actually accommodating in this AP. And this complete equation is fairly complicated. Complicated in the sense is that if you want to do, express this just non-uniform non gravitational field of the Earth, you have to expand this equation using legendary polynomial. And that could be of various orders and degrees, right? And that becomes very complicated. Uh, let's not talk about that. This, this is for just general information that these uh, details go, goes on when we want to determine the position of the satellite very accurately. Now, let us talk about a little bit of effect of the perturbation forces. So I was talking about this uh, legend, legendary polynomials, right? That in order and degree. So if we increase the order of the uh, and degree of the legendary legend polynomial, then we can actually have a smaller error. So the first one that you can see at at a um, at the end of on the time series t, a, 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 x axis. So there you can see this is the order two, right? So and the error is very high, around sixty kilometer. However, at the same point, if you use order twenty, it's less, around twenty kilometer of error. That is, this is the only propagation, by the way, of a model, right? So this much is the error. So this is basically from there, it's very clear. I hope that the perturbation forces have a huge effect. I mean, 60, 70 kilometers are 
not a uh, not a small number for satellite navigation problems, right? So then, uh, so now the thing is that suppose even we are using this twenty twenty, uh, I mean, uh, uh, space agencies actually use a higher order ones, 200, uh, 200th order in degree. So all these things they use, but still they are not fairly accurate. So for that, what we do is that for some satellites, we use global navigation satellite system, GPS signals we use from there, we take the observations and we have uh, this high fidelity model. This high fidelity model is used for propagating the states and then we update using extended Kalman filter. Now you could ask that, okay, why we are not using unscented or uh, uh, Kalman filter or others as the equations are fairly complicated or nonlinear, right? Uh, we could use, but eventually if you use that and find that EKF and UKF actually gives a similar result, right? We'll talk a little bit about why this is happening. Although all these applications that we are talking about is nonlinear, but UKF and for some, some problem it's give you, it does not improve your estimation at right so that we'll also discuss so for the interest of time i'll skip the various error sources that we have in the gnss rather i'll show that directly go to the result if you use this gps observation so this is our grace orbit determination or estimation of position of grace satellites using this extended carbon filter using extended color filter and we are using GPS observation. So there, if you look at X, Y and Z axis and the RMS error, right? So the dotted line is basically the standard deviation that we have and the, error, the blue line is the error, right? So within five kilometer, five meter here. Here, take a look. So here we had this around 20 kilometer. If we do just only propagation, and here we have using ex extended Kalman filter, we can find the error within almost five meter. However, we are not very happy with that as well, right? So for uh, for uh, for uh, these uh, SAR applications, SAR imaging applications, uh, people need centimeter level of accuracy, and for so that is called a precise orbit determination. So there we have to use carrier phase processing of the GPS. So that is again, different story that we are working on. But <clears throat> again, we can achieve five meter, but we can also achieve centimeter level of this. So that is again for general information. So now- So, these, uh, so uh, these updates in the estimation will be used by the local controller within the satellite, is it? Yes. For, uh, for position correction and so on. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, this, so there'll be a trajectory and then while the trajectory is being tracked, these are the errors. Yes. And then this will be used as uh, for the controllers. Yes, in the controllers. And it is also sometimes, this is done post-processing. So whatever this GNSS of GPS observations is done, it's sent back to the ground station. And on the, on the ground station, it does post-processing. But that is not used for uh, control purpose. So that navigation <clears throat> information that we create on ground, so that is used for image processing purpose. So whatever image we get. Correction and so on. Yes, exactly. Okay, so now we unscented Kalman filter we have, and then we also have a particle filter to tackle more uh, um, nonlinear uh, problem, estimation problems, right? So in the particle filter, it relies on Monte Carlo method. So it's a random sampling and in unscented carbon filter, it was deterministic sampling, uh, predetermined number of samples that you create, but in particle filter, more number of samples you create, the better, right? And it uses also the important sampling. What is the important sampling? Important sampling is basically, the, suppose you have some sort of distribution from here, uh, from where it is very difficult to draw the samples, you use another distribution and you, uh, which is proportional to this, which is easier to sample. So use that uh, distribution to sample. So that is basically called the important sample. So in the sequential important sam sam sampling for the particle filter, the posterior density becomes basically the weighted sum of the difference between the uh, mean and the other samples, right? So that becomes your uh, posterior density, right? And then 
each of the cells. So here you can see weighted sum. So that, that means each of the sample will be associated with, with, with some weights, right? And the weights are uh, recursively determined from each step to another step. So uh, previous step uh, weight and the current step weights are uh, uh, are, uh, are basically proportional related with this formidable looking equation. However, I'll try to explain this in more pictorial fashion. What happens in the propagation step of the particle filter is that you create a number of samples. Could be 1,000, could be 10,000, whatever number that you make. This would be, uh, so when we're talking about this, each of these dots could be a position, say, in XYZ space or something. Yes, exactly. So now you have that equation that you have, Diamond and Darwin equation. Each of them you propagate here, right? And then you can create, you have a distribution, a post prior distribution in the next time step. Yeah. Then what we do is then we try to find out what is the likelihood of each of these samples given the measure. So this is basically this likelihood that you can say, right? So this is the likelihood and the weight is actually proportional to that likelihood function, right? So this is how this, uh, so eventually the, so basically that means the particles which have more likelihood of, of having this uh, 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 measurement, so these, those are provided higher weights and which has a lesser likelihood, these are, uh, those are provided lower weights. And accordingly the density is computed. So this is, I mean, very, top level idea of the particle filter, right? And if you compare the uh, particle filter performance in the re-entry vehicle tracking problem, so there we'll see that a particle filter actually provides even more uh, stability, right? Um, stability than the uncentered Kalman filter. Error is very smaller. However, again, processing time, again, is higher because you use a huge number of samples. You can actually use this extrapolated signal propagation method that I was telling for uh, uh, in the particle filter framework as well. Instead of deterministic sampling, we are doing the uh, this random sampling, but reconstructing all the samples using extrapolated signal propagation technique. So there you will see that the errors actually matches with each other, right? More so your uh, your co-author Dempster is this the same Dempster Schaefer theory? No, no, no. <laughs> That's a different Dempster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so eventually, if we'll see, you can see that ESPP actually does the same thing that that it did between UNS EKF and the UKF. It reduces the processing time without compromising the much of the accuracy. Uh, right. So this is overall particle filter. So now the question I was little bit of bits and pieces I was talking about that. Some problems, uncentered Kalman filters does better, some problems it does not. For satellites, it does not. But for launch vehicle, re-entry vehicle, it do, does better than extended Kalman filter. So then what is the reason of? All of them, the problems are non-linear, right? But then uh, the, we do not get that expected performance of the uncentered Kalman filter. So we have found that there is a relation between the degree of nonlinearity of a system, how nonlinear it is, at some quantification we can create, right? So it's highly nonlinear, moderately nonlinear, or not very nonlinear. What, what are the point. tools? Uh, what are the tools available to measure that degree of nonlinear? So degree of nonlinearity. There are various tools that are available. So here we have used the degree of nonlinearity by uh, definition by. Uh, John Kings. So he's from aerospace uh, field. So this, uh, so John Kings's definition is that we create this various number of samples, then we calculate the state transition matrix. Uh, we calculate the state trans transition matrix, and then we take the difference between the state state transition matrix of uh, this from the mean to that all the samples, and divide it by the modulus of the mean state transition matrix. Right? So now you will have this n number of different state, state transition matrix. Out of them, what is this? The uh, supremum of it, right? So, so that, okay, so difference of these state transition matrix, we take the uh, Hilbert-Schmidt norm of that, so that it becomes a bit scalar, mm -hmm. right? And then we normalize it using the 
uh, again not Hilbert Schwinn norm of the say mean state transition matrix. So and then we have this n number of these values and take the supremum. So that we can say as the nonlinearity index. So for satellites, actually the nonlinearity index is very small. And for launch vehicle and re-entry vehicle, this is very high. And this gamma parameter that you have seen, so that is the difference between the extended Kalman filter error and the unscented Kalman filter error, normalized by the unscented uh, extended Kalman filter error. Again, the mod modulus of normal. So then again, it becomes a vector. So we have shown that this uh, gamma, right? So this gamma actually uh, increases with increased nonlinearity. So these two are basically the boundary. So within this bound bounds, these gamma values will change for various nonlinearity, right? So this x axis basically is our nonlinearity for the system plus nonlinearity of the measurement in the measurement. So as we go in the right, uh, right our gamma will be increased, right? The improvement of the unscented Kalman filter. So what this chart tells us that if you use for the supply navigation problem, the gamma is very small because NS plus NM is small. That means extended and unscented Kalman filter will give more or less similar performance. But for launch vehicle and reentry vehicle, this NS plus NM is high. That means gamma is high. So that is why we are getting smaller, uh, uh, higher uh, uh, improvement in the unscented and extended karma than the extended extended karma field. So now the question is that okay, and this is another way of telling this that we have linear to nonlinear in the x-axis, right? It's again, it's not, it's a qualitative sense, it's not a quantitative sense. So LEO, MEO, HEO, lower high art, medium art orbit satellites, they, when they're circular orbits, linear non-linearity index is smaller. And for interplanetary trajectory elliptical orbits, it's somewhere middle and launch vehicle, reentry vehicle navigation, there your non-linearity is very high, right? So, and obviously we're, although we are considering Gaussian, but in reality, they're not Gaussian as well. So that, that is again, different story. Let's not talk about that. Uh, so now the question is how to choose. I have talked about a various, a series, various uh, type of estimators, extended Kalman filter, unscented Kalman filter, two variants of the unscented Kalman filter, particle filter, a variant of the particle filter as well, right? How to choose for navigation and tracking problem, right? So some considerations we have to take while we choose. For tracking, there's an abundance of computation resources because we are doing it on ground. So we can use supercomputer, we can use a cluster, right? So that's not an issue. Observation accuracy is mostly on the higher side. Latency can be issue. Latency in the sense is that whenever you're talking about deep space navigation, right? So sometimes it takes a longer time to signal to come back, right? So it's not in the real time anymore, right? So that is, uh, one, this is tracking. For the navigation, we are doing it on the satellite itself. We cannot put a supercomputer, we cannot put a GPU on the satellite, right? Because of the, they take a lot of power, also it's heavy. Computation research is limited, observations are not very accurate. So based on that, what to choose, right? So now let us look at this chart where we have three different axes. One is the processing, low, medium, high. One is the nonlinearity, again, low, medium, high, and the accuracy, low, medium, high. If you look at the extended Kalman filter, accuracy is low. I mean, the what you can find out, a gate for a, it can handle moderate nonlinearity. However, your processing time is low as well, right? But the UKF and other variants, for the UKF, your uh, processing time is higher. It can handle higher nonlinearity. It gives you better accuracy, but only thing is that your processing is high. SPUKF and USPUKF, if you look at it, it can handle higher nonlinearity, accuracy high, but processing time is lower, right? 
So from this chart, I think you can always try to, based on your uh, your uh, uh, um, problem, you can actually try to uh, select which one to use. Similar to similarly, uh, thing goes for the particle filter you gave. ESP uh, PF, right? If you have a very good processing capability, use particle filter, no problem, right? It can handle very good, uh, very high nonlinear, it can, and also it can provide you good accuracy. But processing time is not, processing uh, resource is an issue. In that case, possibly use UKF or ESP PF, depending on the pro what problem you are using, right? So I think with that, I will stop the presentation here so if there are any questions yeah so any questions from our uh, from our audience maybe wait for a minute and there is one in the chat window uh does the thermal conditions impact perturbation so it, could you elaborate what you mean by the therm thermal conditions Change in temperature, yes. So change in temperature in the sense is that that is accounted in the solar radiation pressure itself, right? So what happens is that temperature is high when the, the satellite is facing the sun, right? And when it is beyond, uh, behind the earth, then you have a low temperature, right? So, so not directly from the temperature you get some uh, perturbation, but what you get is from this, Photons that you get, solar radiation pressure, right? For the, for the temperature itself does not actually affect your forces, perturbation forces. Can a combination of ground tracking and navigation be used? Uh, depends. That depends. So so what happens if you want to do this combination? Right, so then it becomes a more complicated, right? So what you have to do is that you have one set of observations which are coming is coming from the ground, right? And so a set of observations that is happening on the satellite, right? Now, if you want to combine, you have to send some data either to the from the satellite to ground or from the ground to the satellite, right? You can always do that, but then the depend uh, it depends on what is your purpose. If your purpose is real-time navigation, then I think it's not a good idea because then you have a lot of latency com will come into picture because of this communication happening to and fro between the ground station and the satellite. But if it's your uh, purpose is just tracking from the ground, right? So then it is always done to improve your accuracy. So for, for what happens in the ground is that, as I mentioned, you have this, uh, uh, this radars are there which tracks the satellites, right? Satellite laser imaging, using laser they uh, also may measure. Also, the satellite itself has the GPS observations. So those gets transferred to the ground station. So you take all of them together and then it's still. However, this, this is not a real time process then. So that becomes only that. I hope that answers the question. So how often are these uh, corrections actually performed, say in uh, our uh, like a geostationary orbit satellite or something like that? Uh, you mean the orbit corrections? Yeah, any of these. I mean, I'm sure if it's geostationary, it will be typically on one location on the Earth's surface. And if there is always these perturbations, like are we talking about corrections every one hour, one day? So that I'm not really sure how, how frequently they do the corrections. Station keeping, right? So that uh, I do not know the exact frequency. But I'm guessing the time constants for these corrections will also be fairly small, right? We're talking maybe a few seconds or something like that. Yes, yes. So it is not the continuously they are not doing it. At right. certain point, if we, if some allowable debris, uh, it goes beyond some allowable deviation, then starts this station keeping and come back to the intended orbit. So the uh, launch vehicles and the re-entry vehicles, these would again, the re-entry vehicle I'm guessing would be some sort of a fixed wing aircraft, no? A fixed wing aircraft model is what would be applicable? Uh, well, yes. So for example, if you think of space shuttle kind of vehicle, right? So they are fixed wing aircraft. Yeah. But here the re-entry vehicle that we are considering is just 
this uh, uh, cone shaped vehicles, right? Okay. So cone shaped vehicles is just come. It does not oh, have. Oh, okay, okay. Again, we are looking at things with thrust vectoring or something like that. So there's like really no need for uh, uh, wings of any sort. No. So there for real, yeah, well, so for real vehicle that I am considering here, it does not have the thrust vectoring at all. Okay. It does not have any control, right? So only thing, if it's a human human on board, so then you have a parachute whenever it comes near the ground, the parachute opens and then and, and splashes, right? So only thing under control when during this re-entry of this type of vehicle is that re-entry point. Okay, okay, okay. Once you know where the re-entry point is, then after that you can predict how it is going to uh, move. Yes. Uh, the key is to find out and ensure that you actually go to that point. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. So it's kind of hoping, okay, so it will go there. Okay, but uh, so the uh, you showed that graph of that index of nonlinearity or something, no? So yes. This, like in one of the graphs. So, I mean, yeah. again, is that primarily because uh, yeah, this one. So is that primarily because again there are no gravitational effects in space? No, no. It's it's uh, so if you this relation. Although I have shown this for the launch, I mean, uh, launch vehicle satellite context, these relations are done for generic nonlinear functions, a uh, generalized nonlinear function. Okay. It's but, not the, a, but the gravity uh, function still holds for a satellite. If that holds still, your it that becomes, I mean, the uh, uh, moderately or low, no, low, in, very small nonlinear will be there. If it is circular or but if it is an elliptical orbit, then the behavior becomes different. It's nothing to do with, or I mean, the uh, perturbation forces effect has a very small uh, effect on this nonlinear. It's the shape of the orbit has a more effect. I see how close you are or away from the uh, Earth's uh, yes, yes, semi axis lens of that ellipse and so on. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions from our uh, audience? Okay, so thanks, uh, Dr. Sanat. It is uh, a pleasure to listen to your work on uh, carbon filters. I, I, I hope at some point you'll be, or maybe you've already implemented this on some existing systems that are in space right now. Uh, no, no, not yet. I have not got that opportunity, but I, <laughs> I hope to do at some point. <laughs> okay, good. All right, thank you. And uh, I hope we get a chance to meet you in person and maybe work together as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It would be very uh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.